Um, he, uh, during his time at Penn, built a center for neuromuscular clinical trials that focuses on clinical trials for patients with ALS and muscular dystrophy, in addition to helping to direct Penn centers uh, for ALS um, and their muscular dystrophy association clinic. Uh, Dr. Quinn did his neurology residency at UPenn, followed by a neuromuscular fellowship at MGH and the Brigham. Um, after that, spent two years at UMass working with Dr. Bob Brown, uh, developing clinical trials for patients with MS and ALS. Um, he's also heavily involved in teaching neurology residents and fellows. Um, he's an excellent teacher and uh, has the dubious honor of being on service during the first weeks of July um, every year. Um, so maybe a little bit tired today um, as a result. Um, we're, as I said, very fortunate ha to have him here to discuss uh, clinical trials uh, in ALS over the past decades, um, many of which he's been involved in, um, in, in, in addition to uh, promising advances in the field, um, hopefully, in the coming decades. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Kristen. That was really a kind introduction. It's really uh, cool to be able to come here at, in person um, you, you know, flying to Seattle. I haven't uh, been flying anywhere for talks for for quite a while, so it's it's really cool. I enjoyed dinner last night. Everyone's been super kind and friendly. Uh, I have some disclosures. Uh, I've highlighted the ones in which I've been on an advisory board. I am involved in most of these trials, so um, I have conflicts there. My hope is that you'll see I'm skeptical of everything. So. <laughs> Uh, Kristen did a really nice introduction. I made this slide for a senior citizen science group, and if you ever have the opportunity to give a lecture to a senior citizen science group, I would take it super fun. You know, remote people are in bed, eating, falling asleep while you're talking, but this was their favorite slide. Uh, just, you know, because it's sometimes it's hard to figure out like how people come to be where they are. It's also a tribute to Bob Brown, who um, was my mentor at UMass. And I just carry him with me all the time. He's, he's alive, he's not deceased. Uh, but uh, I still, I kind of carry, he, he has this, he's someone who's so smart that you just know right away, like you're not gonna be him, but his energy is what you kind of capture and his optimism and the way that he, and this, we're talking about ALS, it's not a disease that provokes optimism from people much of the time. But as someone who is a leader in the field, still every day kind of wakes up and is ready to go and, um, you know, wants to chart a, a positive path forward. So uh, I feel like no neurology presentation. So it's only one history slide, so don't sweat it if you're like, can we do it? No, no more with the history of ALS. But it is interesting, you know, it's interesting kind of how far we haven't come, maybe. Uh, you know, we've learned so much, and yet Charcot's description. So Charcot is this French neurologist who's really famous. He, he kind of, the way he makes his name is, I mean, he's an outstanding clinician, um, but he really makes kind of anatomical uh, connections to what he's seeing clinically. So he names the disease, a lot of people say, well, why is it called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis? Well, amyotrophy is muscle atrophy. And the lateral sclerosis is basically that if you take, well, let's see if this little thing, I'm having that weird moment where anyone who tries to use, a, all right, I'm gonna use the, the mouse piece here, or I won't use anything. Um, if you take a probe and you kind of scrape it on the lateral portion of the spinal cord, it's hard, it's sclerosed, because those are where the corticospinal tracts live. And uh, so that's, that's why it's called that. It's muscle atrophy and loss of these neurons in the lateral spinal cord. His description was really good. This is kind of what ALS looks like, right? So upper and lower motor neuron signs, atrophy, fasciculations, and these uh, increased reflexes. You know, whenever you get into the details of these things, because we originally described these cases in, 18, in the 1860s, and there, there's always things that aren't true that I really enjoy in their descriptions, but most of it really is kind of spot on. And unfortunately, the kind of average survival, and we haven't really moved the needle on that. So I would describe ALS as a kind of common, uncommon disease. Like, what, what do we mean by that? Well, it's not heart attacks, it's not strokes. But you're gonna know someone who has ALS. Uh, if you run an ALS clinic, you're gonna know a lot of people who have ALS, but just in, in the community, you're gonna know people. I think the, the top uh, red line there, the lifetime risk really strikes people. It's one in 350 for men, one in 400 for women. And then the other thing is, is it's a very heterogeneous disease. So 
even though we say average survival is three years, well, there's a significant number of people who are living longer than five years and longer than 10 years. And that really informs kind of how our initial discussions should go with patients about ALS and just being humble about what we know and what we don't know when we're trying to prognosticate. All right, there's a lot going on in this slide. I will admit that, uh, but it, it, I think that if we really knew what was going on with ALS, we probably would make a much simpler slide. Um, this, this is the kind of parable of the, the blind men and the elephant, and I think we are still living in that, but we're getting better that we kind of are still looking at tails and trunks a little bit, but we're starting to see, especially in the impaired RNA processing realm, that's where kind of the hot topic is that uh, some of the most important pathological features, or maybe the most important pathological feature, TDP43 accumulation. TDP43 is involved in RNA processing, and there's multiple genes that seem to, if you mutate them, um, cause ALS that are involved in RNA processing. So that seems to be an important area. And that's as deep as we're gonna go with pathophysiology here. But I mentioned, I mentioned genes, our understanding of the genes involved in ALS. So again, 90, it's a 90% sporadic disease, so only 10% are familial. But you can really leverage that 10% to try to figure out what pathways are affected in ALS, right? So you can see, uh, Bob Brown discovered, um, my mentor, the, the original SOD1 gene, and for a long time, that's the only gene, what all the models are based on. And then you can see since uh, 2000, boom, it's just been exploding that we have more and more genes. Those individual genes probably don't matter that much because they're so rare, but the, on the right, what you see is trying to connect what are the pathways that all these genes are involved in? So trying to figure out what are the common pathways that would lead to a motor neuron specifically being vulnerable to death. So I had to, so I made this talk originally for a group a year ago, and I had to change this. So I've had to add three drugs. I originally it was just, you know, really is all. We're gonna talk about the other, the, the three drugs as part of the kind of last decade but we'll just touch on really is all because it is the tried and true, you know, it's not the sexy drug because it's not coming, coming out, it's cheap. Uh, but, you know, it, it has a pretty consistent benefit. If you take any database, um, we have a database at Penn, if you drop in really is all, not really is all, it has a survival benefit. In the original trial, that survival benefit was largely driven by people with bulbar onset disease who have more rapid progression. And it kind of makes sense, they would tend to die within the trial period. So it's been approved since 1995. But things have grown since then. So like trials have really, really taken off. And I think there's a risk that this talk is just a fire hose of trial, 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 trial. And I'm not even coming close. I'm sure someone somewhere will, will be disappointed that a trial they were involved in is, isn't on here. But um, I really wanted to just kind of cover different genres of trials. Um, specifically neuroprotection, stem cells, uh, immune modulation, and genetic approaches. Um, in order to talk about trials, we kind of have to talk about outcome measures in ALS, and this is as deep as we're gonna go, but basically the main outcome measures in most ALS trials, so originally we started with survival, but survival's tough because you have to make a trial really long to see if people live. And it turns out survival is important to people, but function is really, really important to people. So, um, we use uh, the ALS FRS, which is imperfect. It's a, an ordinal scale, not a interval scale. So, uh, so the, the steps between things aren't even. So that makes it hard. So if you, for example, start using a railing when you go upstairs, you drop from a four to a one. It's, it's a big drop for a kind of a small change. Um, and then the other thing is breathing strength. That's a, so we use vital capacity as a proxy. How much air can you blow out in a single breath? Um, as a, as a measure for breathing strength, which also isn't perfect because there are people who are short of breath and their vital capacity seems like it looks pretty good. So it's a, it's a proxy. So we'll start with neuroprotection. So someone will debate whether or not all the trials I've listed as negative are actually negative. So the, the clean group, the C, CNMAU8, they would claim that they had some positive results from their trial, but they're negative. These are negative trials. Um, if someone wants to do another trial and try again and frame it differently, fine, but these were all negative trials. I will say, I give a shout out to mixilatine, actually my favorite drug. 
uh, because it really helps people's cramps. Um, it does not appear to slow disease progression, but there are two randomized control trials that show that mixilatine really helps with cramps, and I am, I am a believer. It's the one drug that I actually get phone calls from people saying like, hey, thanks. No one, no one calls me for their Relibrio to say, you know, thank you, but they do call me for their mixilatine to say, hey, I'm, my cramps are really much better. So the two positive trials actually resulted in drug approval, so we're gonna kind of focus on that. So this is a lot on this slide, so let, don't worry. We're gonna, we're gonna walk through it. So Adarivone, Radicava, it's a free radical scavenger. What the heck does that mean? Essentially, when you have cellular injury, you release these highly reactive species called free radicals that then go on and injure other parts of the cell or other cells. And so you can imagine that in any disease where you're having lots of neuron loss, especially unplanned cell death, you are gonna have this injury. This drug was originally researched in stroke in Japan in the 90s, and they kind of dusted it off, cut and paste the stroke protocol, which was 14 days of treatment, um, and then applied it to ALS patients. And, and the first trial actually failed. And this is kind of an important sea change in how ALS trials work after this. So, so in the original trial, it was basically what I would call a normal ALS population, kind of like average ALS, um, you know, within a few years of having disease, kind of breathing strength that they thought would be good enough to make it through the trial, um, kind of normal research ALS, which is still better than clinic ALS, right? Still cutting out a significant fraction of people who they would be concerned wouldn't make it through the trial. But they did not see a positive result. I'm going to try one more time to see if I can get this. Oh, oh there it is. I just... We all saw it for a second there and then disappeared. Okay, uh, so that graph in the middle, basically what it's trying to show you is that the definite population, so that's from that trial, the definite ALS population, so people who had lots of disease burden and appeared to be, they thought, hmm, maybe it looks like maybe there's an effect there. So they actually did the right thing. You know, it's funny, this drug kind of doesn't always have the best reputation among uh, ALS providers for reasons we can talk about, but. Um, they actually did the right thing. They did another trial, and they just focused on that population. Now, so the, this, this kind of becomes the standard now. So definite ALS, meaning when we say definite ALS, it's not I'm sure they have ALS. It's actually based upon how many body regions are affected. So it's actually more like broadly affected ALS and rapidly progressing. And they saw about a 30% difference in the change in that survey of symptoms, the ALS-FRS. Um, over a six month period. They tried to prove that there's a survival benefit uh, using this data, it wasn't totally clear that that was true. Uptake of this drug was very limited initially because it was IV, so you had to get a port. And then so combine a small trial in a very select group of people and then you have to get a port, very few people are taking this drug. But last year, not because of another trial, but because they proved that the bioavailability was equivalent, they approved the oral form and that has really uh, driven up how much uh, people take the drug. But uh, this, I could mention cost on every single slide. This just happens to be a good example of where we can tell we have a comparison of how much the drug costs in the country where it was actually developed and all the R&D, because that's usually the kind of reasoning, right? That it's the research and development, it's paying for the next drug, that's why these drugs are expensive. Well, in Japan, we had, we had Gabe Pilar put together a nice slide of who's a former fellow. Um, years ago that basically shows you you could travel to Japan, stay in the nicest hotel, fly first class, uh, and come out tens of thousands of dollars ahead uh, than getting the drug in the US. So cost is a, big, is a big issue. And then there's been questions about real world. So real world, what do we mean? Just like in clinic, how does this drug actually play out? There's a German study that, that looks at a bunch of different, this German motor disease network and they just pulled all their data together. And they really couldn't see a difference in that ALS FRS between people who were on drug and who weren't. But then, so keep in mind, this is an MT Pharma sponsored study, the one on the bottom. Um, but using a, a insurance uh, claims database, they did actually find a significant six month difference in the survival between the people who were on drug and people who were not. So kind of back and, back and forth, um, it has, very few side effects. Um, the, I think this, the issue still remains with many of these drugs. Does it apply to the broad ALS population? So I basically tell patients, like, if you look like the trial, then I'm pretty confident the drug might do something. If you don't look like someone who's in the trial, 
I'm not actually sure what the effect of the drug is. So on to the next controversial uh, approval. So um, Relivrio was approved last year. That's actually sodium phenylbutyrate and tercidiol. It's a combination drug. Why is it a combination drug? We'll talk about that in a second, but it's a combination drug focusing on phenyl phenylbutyrate, which is supposed to kind of stabilize the function and the, the survival of the endoplasmic reticulum, and then uh, terso, which is supposed to uh, stabilize the survival of the mitochondria. And it's thought that maybe these have a synergistic effect. Why would we even care about a synergistic effect of these two drugs? Well, they have their own data individually that predates the existence of this combo drug. So you can see from 2009, so a while ago, 2015, not that long ago, um, each drug has some evidence that it may help, help in ALS. So in this drug, we actually don't, no one did a trial where you give A, B, and A plus B. No, no one actually did that in humans. It was done in mice, uh, but not done in, in humans. So we don't actually know what's carrying the weight here. If you have uh, 15 minutes to kill, the kind of origins of this drug are fascinating. If you're a basic scientist, I would not read this article because it'll make you feel really bad about you can just Google why do neurons die, uh, <laughs> which is what Josh, the guy on the left, did. Um, and he just started like playing around in his dorm room in Brown and through fraternity connections and a bunch of things that you may not be surprised really help you in life. Uh, ended up creating a company and a drug and ended up with this phase two trial. So really using the template laid out by Radakava, right? So now, okay, we're gonna, it looks like if we use these definite, again, broadly affected patients who, are, who haven't had the disease that long, less than 18 months, we think they're gonna progress rapidly and we're gonna be able to check the difference. One thing I would note is it's three grams of phenylbutyrate and one gram of tetka, that's a lot of powder. That's a lot of powder to take in, which is gonna have uh, cause some side effects. And again, we're looking at the ALS FRS decline. So um, the trial was positive. Uh, much to my surprise, even as, a, even as someone who is a site PI, if you'd asked me, I would have said, I don't know, it's this powder, people say it tastes bad. Uh, I have no idea who's on what. Um, interestingly, so it was a 25% slower FRS decline, again, that, that scale of symptoms. I put a box around Atlas as a measure of strength. That's the other positive outcome, but really all the secondary outcomes are negative. They, they don't. Now, secondary outcomes in small trials are difficult because they're often underpowered. Uh, you're often powering for your primary outcome, right? So, you know, usually what you'd say is, well, we'll get it in the next one, but there is, well, there is a next one, but the drug is approved before the next one's finished. And then they go on to do an open label. So open label is you finish the trial, now everyone's switching to drugs. So in a way, you're handicapping your observations because people are now on drug. Everybody's on drug. You're just assuming that there's a difference between starting the drug six months earlier versus six months later. It's kind of a delayed start uh, analysis. And depending on which uh, version of the analysis you look at, it's between a five and a six month uh, benefit. One notable uh, thing is that a third of people did not go on to the open label. So you lost a lot of people there and that can cause uh, bias. So we started, I was the site PI for the next. So we're supposed to do the next thing, right? So usually for FDA, it's two randomized controlled trials, um, but the drug got approved in the middle of all that. The trial continues in Europe where the drug is not approved. So I'm still very eagerly waiting those results. Controversy as to whether or not that, you know, patient advocacy groups want these drugs approved, um, but we want to know if they work. And I am both a patient advocate and someone who wants to know if what I'm doing every day matters. Uh, so uh, I get the controversy. At the same time, I just have to point out that these, these are all my co-fellows. These were all the people that I graduated fellowship with. And uh, three of us are on this paper. I did not highlight my own name because it's too buried in the list of authors, but Shafi Karam, who's the guy on the right, I, I, I work with at UPenn and he was my co-fellow. And Sabrina Paganoni was actually the overall PI for the study. So as much as I understand there's controversy, it was quite a moment for us to be able to kind of go through this process together. So what are the take home lessons from, from neuroprotection? Um, you can't just, I mean, the pre, especially when you're not looking at uh, a drug that you absolutely know is directly related to the pathophysiology of the disease, right? Sometimes it's easy when you just know that like 
this disease is caused by this mutation, let's fix that mutation. It's a little easier to kind of know what's gonna work, although you still need a trial. In these neuroprotective drugs, it's very hard to tell what's gonna be a winner. And I just think that neuroprotective effects may be limited. We're kind of experimenting right now with combining them because just naturally that experiment is being run by people being on Viliazol, Relivrio, and Radicava. Um, and trials are different than clinics. So one of the things that's very strange, so we're talking about 20 to 30% effect size in a trial, but we're not seeing that in clinic. I can't feel that. The patient can't feel that. On an individual basis, I have no idea whether or not the drug is working. It's kind of you're taking it on blind faith, which let's say uh, you're taking Radicava and you have no side effects. Maybe you take it every month and you have no problem. When you're getting diarrhea from Relivrio, which is a common side effect, and it tastes terrible, you might question, well, I can't tell that this drug is working. Why do I want to keep doing this? So the next topic is stem cells. Stem cells were kind of the hot thing five years ago. It still actually exists. There are still stem cell trials out there. I feel like it's cooled off a little bit. But there was a time in which stem cells were kind of the future of ALS trials. And that, that took a lot of oxygen out of the room, actually, and a lot of effort. So whenever I'm trying to explain, because people come in less now, but, but you know, five years ago, every patient would come in and say like, all right, like replace my neurons. I just need, you got the cells, I got the, I got the need, hook me up here, replace my neurons. That is not how this works. It's essentially a drug delivery vehicle. That's what it is. You're, you're implanting these cells that kind of are supposed to become like glial cells, the cells that live around neurons and keep them healthier, basically by providing trophic factors, things that keep neurons healthy and happy and reducing inflammation. That's how they work. It's not, I implant this thing and a neuron grows and the motor neuron you lost is now replaced. And explaining that to patients is really critical to making sure that they are starting from the right place when it comes to stem cells. There's lots of different sources uh, that you can get these stem cells and we'll talk about them. And then there's issues between whether you get the cells from the patient themselves or from fetal tissue. Obviously there's some, depending on which corner of the world you're in, there's some controversy about that. And also it affects whether or not you have to immunosuppress someone because you've given them cells that aren't actually their own. So I was involved in uh, the original neuron trial, the original US neuron trial. So they had their Israeli company, they had done an Israeli uh, trial in Israel, and they were uh, bringing it to the United States. And I made a big old mess at UMass trying to, trying to get this going. It's very, it's very logistically complicated. Um, you have to arrange for bone marrow, shipping, delivery, all in a very tight timeline. It was very difficult to do. I promptly um, set up the trial and then left as it was starting. So it was very graceful on my part to dump that onto uh, Dr. Owegi, who took up the trial. Uh, but the idea is that they remove these stem cells, they treat them in a proprietary fashion, which is critical because then they kind of own the technology, um, which isn't, doesn't have to be the case with stem cells so that they kind of are known to produce these trophic factors and have these immunomodulatory effects. So the kind of where brainstorms proprietary stuff comes in is how they treat those stem cells, how they grow them up and kind of teach them to become glial cells. They're pushing them to become glial cells. There was this phase two trial. This was the one that I, I helped set up. Um, again, lots of data. The blue bars kind of represent people who seem to respond. Responding is different than changing the FRS overall. It's basically trying to see people who seem to have a change in their slope. Um, and the red bars are placebo. And so basically the blue bars are bigger than the red bars, suggesting that more people in the treatment group were responding. This was a single dose. So this was encouraging enough that they moved on to their phase three trial. Uh, this was three treatments. And importantly, with this lead in period, because they were trying to select for people who would rapidly progress again, kind of being informed from this Radakava trial where you're trying to get people who you think you're gonna be able to detect a difference because their disease is gonna progress. Unfortunately, that turned out to kind of bite them because people progress too much. Uh, and when you let people progress, it turns out they progress and it actually can make it hard to detect a difference on the other end. Um, so they were looking at the ALS FRS um, as a responder analysis. Again, so rather than just measuring the slopes, 
you're measuring the change in the slope. And anytime you're measuring like a delta of a delta, that's also statistically a little tricky to do and maybe getting further and further from reality. Uh, totally negative, totally negative. Tons of effort, tons and tons and tons of effort. Completely negative trial. But of course, tons of effort, tons of money, people want to find something positive out of it. So they looked at their data and they said, you know what? If we look at the people whose ALS FRS started at greater than 35, again, because it goes to 48, so you're talking about people who are doing pretty well, we think maybe there's something positive in here. They tried that. The p-value is 0.29 because they don't have enough people who actually represent that group. That doesn't stop them, though. Okay, we're still rolling. This train, they've started a hashtag in their own works. Like, I understand. I mean, from a patient perspective, I hold no one at fault for trying to get something they think will help them survive. But uh, there's been a lot of effort to kind of undo this negative trial. So they actually published an erratum in which they said, turns out we misanalyzed this data, and actually it's significant, uh, presto changeo. Um, and maybe there was a floor effect that actually the, these patients were just too sick. And basically, once you get to zero on a, on a scale, you can't go lower than zero. So they were saying there's too many zeros starting when we're doing the measuring. And then, because we'll talk about Calsati gets approved based upon neurofilament light chain, then they're analyzing, oh, we had an effect on neurofilament light chain, which, by the way, those error bars cross quite nicely. So maybe you did, maybe you didn't. I think all of this, I'm, I'm not such a skeptic that I don't think that they don't need another trial. I think it would be very interesting to do another trial, but we're still trying to push this through. And when you think about how this would revolutionize how clinic works, which we'll talk about in a sec, I don't think that's a good idea. Speaking of other things that may or may not be a good idea, so, so some people are familiar with compassionate use, right? So compassionate use is being able to get a drug outside of a trial. Um, that's existed for forever. You basically need the permission of the FDA, and usually you, know, you work at a university when you're doing these things, so you get the permission of the Institutional Review Board. Um, that wasn't good enough uh, for people because this wasn't, be, it was, compassionate use wasn't being used. I don't think that was just because it was difficult to go through the FDA. The FDA is actually quite kind about these things and very willing to work with us. It's more just companies didn't want to do it, and it's a lot of work on the physician end for something that you don't know whether or not it does anything. So this bill was passed um, called Right to Try, which basically you don't have to go through the FDA anymore. Just the, the company has to agree and the physician has to agree, and that's it. Um, it was a big deal during the neuron period. Only one person, who happened to be my patient, uh, was treated through that method, and we haven't heard much about it uh, since. So there are other stem cell trials. Um, actually, the, the most kind of encouraging stem cell trial was done in South Korea. Uh, that's their result uh, up top there. You see some good, good separation, but Phase three trials ongoing. It's actually approved there. There's a phase three trial uh, ongoing, but it's not like I've heard from South Korea that ALS has fundamentally changed there since this has been approved. So this is why it's often helpful to have a second trial. Nathan Staff at the Mayo Clinic has been doing uh, stem cells from uh, fat tissue and without kind of proprietary in intervention. So there's no pharmaceutical backer, so it's very hard to get these trials going because there's no money to, to do it. So he's done this on kind of a shoestring uh, budget. It's been very, very slow, but he continues to make progress. And then there's Neurostem, which is uh, no longer Neurostem. Uh, they changed the name to Seneca. Basically, this is looking at um, fetal uh, cell transplants directly into the spinal cord, uh, which is cool because you're getting directly to where the motor neurons are, but also you have to do a multi-level laminectomy and inject the cells directly into the spinal cord. Um, I think that it's interesting, but I'm not exactly sure how you roll that out uh, beyond a trial. Like, are we just going to do full laminectomies all the way up and down the spine? That seems a little unlikely. And I think investors have felt the same way. Um, so lead-in periods are kind of interesting on the one hand because the idea is that you can pick kind of what someone's slope was, but they also can result um, in delay of treatment, and it's, I think every trial is trying to tell us that the earlier you treat, the better. That's what all of these trials say. So, kind of setting your, you're setting yourself up to fail if you're delaying treatment. Um, I think a huge question is just 
maybe there's some benefit in some of these stem cells, but is it enough for us to totally change how clinic works? Everybody's got to go for their bone marrow. Everybody's got to come for these injections. And when you think about how much effort is going to go into that, the effect needs to be, to, in my mind, more than taking really is all, which I can just write a prescription for and check liver enzymes and, and we're done. And, and then there's this kind of like, I've always felt with neural stem, and I just had this conversation about another direct injection treatment, where I feel like you, you, can, you can get so far by looking down at your shoes and just taking one step at a time, but every once in a while it'd be helpful to look up on the horizon and say like, how exactly would this work? Like, even if this works, unless the effect is massive, how is this gonna actually work? Are we gonna do laminectomies? throughout the spine to inject things in people's spinal cords. That seems, it better really work if that's what we're doing. All right, so we're to uh, the immune system, which has been a topic for quite a while, as we'll see. So the immune system is not thought to be a primary cause of ALS, right? But it is thought that the immune system plays a critical role. And I would kind of focus on the top right where it says neurodegeneration. And basically you have this, uh, these aggregations of proteins and RNA as we saw in that initial pathophysiology slide. And that's provocative to the immune system, activates, activates the microglia, which activates astrocytes. And basically you get into this spiral of um, the immune system kind of activating itself. And we do know that people who have more inflammation uh, by measures of inflammation do worse. So it's been a compelling topic for quite a while. I once found, I found this in a file cabinet at UMass. Um, this is Bob uh, Brown. This consent was incredibly short for what they were doing. So they were giving uh, cytoxan to people. And it was just like, hey, do you want some cytoxan? Let's see how it goes. That's basically how it consent. You now consents are like 34 pages. I think this was like front and back. I mean, it's actually a nice uh, description, but it's short. Um, and we've tried all, all, everything from total lymphoid radiation to steroids, you know, we've tried all of that and none of that has had a positive effect or so it seems. Uh, I'm gonna talk about NIP ALS, which I did not realize was called nipples the entire time that I was uh, the PI for the trial. I just called it NIP ALS, because you're nipping ALS in the bud, that's what I thought. And then uh, another PI one time told me, like, you realize it's called nipples, right? I'm like, nope, no, no clue. And these are other ongoing, ongoing trials. So the reason why I bring up uh, NIP ALS is because um, it's, I was involved in it, number one. And number two, it's kind of the heavy-handed approach. Like, you'd think, like, okay, if a heavy-handed, like, let's just make the immune system not function, this is it, right? Like beyond total body radiation, like this is a lot. So look, you don't have to know what all these medications do, just that's a lot of immunosuppression. And it's basically following transplant grade immunosuppression. And the, and the reason why the trial existed was because that neural stem thing that I was talking about where they were injecting fetal cells, they needed to basically treat it like someone had a transplant. And one patient seemed to do exceptionally well, like gained function after the injection, and maybe gained function in areas where he shouldn't have. Um, so in terms of they're injecting it regionally. Um, so the thought was, well, maybe, maybe it was the transplant grade immunosuppression we gave. So this was designed to find a responder, just somebody else who would do the same thing, not, not like averaging everybody out, but is there a profile, kind of an immune profile of someone who will respond? Um, so this, this design, uh, trial was kind of designed with the, the lead-in, um, six months of treatment, six months of follow-up. There was no responder found. We, we couldn't see. In fact, people did worse. It, it, being on transplant grade immunosuppression, if you don't need it, is not good for you. Uh, I bring up mesitinib um, partially because they, they have a different approach. They are actually looking at kind of normal ALS, they're actually really trying to go for people who just progress at, who aren't slow. So rather than trying to go for people who are fast, they're looking at people who aren't slow. Their, their data was published, I mean, 2020 is when this article is from, and it's very significant in terms of the ALS FRS. This is from a phase two slash three trial. Um, and everyone was really excited about it. They have been so slow to roll out. We actually dropped out of the trial because it was, 
it was so difficult to, I don't know if it's the CRO or what the, the issue was, but we, and I know Mayo did the same thing. We had to drop out because it was just taking so long to get the trial rolling. Um, but they just recently in April presented the data looking at um, moderate and moderate to severe, again, kind of demonstrating that if you can get these people who aren't too sick, you can potentially have a significant survival benefit. So I'm sad that we're not in the trial. I think that it could be a promising drug, but it was unfortunately just logistically, it was not working out. This is the only time I'm gonna mention the platform trial, which you guys are actually in. The platform trial is compelling as an idea. So it's taking kind of from cancer, they'll test multiple drugs at the same time on different people and use a common placebo group. So um, there are many more, and we're up to G, F, hold on, I got it in my F. F and G at the same, yeah. So there are many more arms than what I'm showing here. All of these trials have been uh, negative. The, the idea though is that you get, you go into the trial, you first get uh, uh, selected for a regimen and then you use a shared placebo. So you, you have very few people on placebo, which is kind of nice. A Zaluka plan is an immunomodulatory therapy and it was negative. The rest of these were negative too. I just exit out here because um, it's, it, it, we're in the immunomodulatory section. So what are the lessons learned from immunomodulation? More is not more. So trying to just suppress the immune system uh, totally doesn't really work. I just wonder if inflammation is too far downstream to have a significant impact. And maybe this is particularly an area, the, the immune system is so complicated that maybe this is an area where animal models really don't help us that much. All right, so we've made it to gene therapies. So if, if you wanna know anything about gene therapies in ALS, just read this article. This is, this is by Daphna, our, our colleague. She is such a good writer and such a good presenter. Uh, just don't, just stop listening to me and read this. So <laughs> she, it's a great review of genetic therapies in ALS and kind of all of the different approaches, which are helpful actually, if you wanna know about gene therapies in general. So there's non-viral strategies, which we're gonna talk about, in which you're giving essentially synthetic DNA. Synthetic DNA will match up with RNA. Um, and when the body sees, you know, uh, DNA is supposed to be double-stranded. RNA is supposed to be single-stranded. When you see double-stranded RNA, the body identifies that and tries to pull it out of circulation. So you can kind of harness that. You can use ASOs, antisense oligos, which again, um, synthetic DNA, in many ways. But in, I'm just talking about the one on the right. You can see you can get uh, alternative splicing or um, you, can, you can use it in lots of different ways. But in this case, we're talking about using it to silence an RNA that you don't want. You can also use silencing through AAV mediated, which is basically using a virus to infect a cell, and then you've got a piece of uh, RNA in there. It start, well, sorry, it starts making RNA that's single-stranded that will pair with the RNA you don't want and target it for degradation. There's CRISPR, which lots of people hear about, but is a little dangerous because it makes breaks in your, your DNA, but that's getting worked out. And then we don't use this in ALS, but you can imagine if you just use a viral vector to deliver a gene you were missing, that could be a highly effective uh, mechanism as well, but not, not so much in ALS so far. Super busy slide, don't worry about it. All this says is how do we get to these antisense therapies? So on the left are all, all of the different combinations that were tried to try to knock down SOD1. And the one that's circled, you'll notice just has like among the lowest bar, like how much it knocked down SOD1. So then they select that one. You see how long this takes? So this is 2006, the drug was approved last year, right? They select from there, they try it in mice, they see that we get better survival. So, okay, mice do better, but mice do better with a lot of things. Uh, so mouse data is not human data. But we got human data. And the initial human data is super encouraging. Uh, that's Toby Ferguson. The drug is called Tofersen. They didn't, the company denies that that has any relationship to Toby Ferguson. I am highly skeptical. Uh, <clears throat> and, um, and Tim Miller, sorry. Uh, Tim Miller is the overall PI for the study and a guy who's done a lot of basic science research in this area. 
in the original study, they show that they can clearly knock down SOD1, particularly with the higher doses of this drug. So again, this is the ASO form. So we're using a synthetic kind of DNA to pair with RNA that we don't want. In this case, SOD1 is a form of familial ALS, and you, you have mutated SOD1, and that mutant SOD1 seems to kind of form clusters that you don't want. So you're trying to pull that SOD1 out of circulation. So that's successful. Also, it seems like these are, these are spaghetti graphs, which kind of look like what they are called. Uh, but what they look like are kind of like they're going straight across rather than pitching down, which is what you'd expect. So very encouraging. So we have a phase three trial, um, which uh, we were a part of. Basically, you're giving this drug intrathecally. That's a critical element that I've left out to this point. So. Um, you give this drug three times over six weeks, and then monthly thereafter, you're injecting it directly in uh, to the spinal fluid through the lumbar spine. So for example, in this trial, I did the injections. It's just like a lumbar puncture, except for we're putting something in there. Um, so they tried to break it into fast and slow progressing groups using the ALSFRS. Turns out that's a bad strategy. Learn a lot of lessons through these, these trials over and over again. Um, and it was a short, I mean, it's, it's a normal length trial, it was six months. Um, and they thought based upon the phase two data, this will be a layup, right? This will be easy. Uh, there were some safety issues. There's some people, so you're injecting this thing that's not supposed to be in there and it causes inflammation. And sometimes it causes a lot of inflammation. So um, there are people who got inflammation of their spinal cord to the point where it affected their function. Some people just had pain. A lot of times you can tell uh, the protein goes high. Sometimes there are white blood cells because we measure the CSF, the spinal fluid, when we take it out. So it's doing something in there. So the Valor results, I was very excited for So, you know, I've be turned into a person who listens to FDA advisory boards and sits on, on these calls anxiously awaiting results. This was a very disappointing day. I mean, I was, so I had someone in this trial, uh, we were talking about it last night. Every every trialist involved in this was certain the drug works because we all have people who we know are doing you know we we're talking about with the neurodegenerative drugs how you can't tell there we all had this feeling that there are just people who are doing too well in this trial but the results stunk i mean they really really stunk uh like no difference whatsoever uh and that was just heartbreaking because it's hard when you the whole time you're doing these things, you're like, I just have to kind of trust the data, you know? But when the data doesn't match what you've actually seen, it's really, really difficult. Fortunately, they kept going. And much like in the, in the we talked about with Relivria, where they had this open label extension, basically people have continued. I still have a patient, so I've done, we were talking last night, 38 intra, intrathecal injections for, for one gentleman. So you, if you map that out over a monthly period, that means I've been doing it for a, a long time. Um, <clears throat> it, it's clear that we get separation. I would point out, though, that even this, even as, as a homer for this drug, who, some, who believes that this drug works, these error bars are crossing all over the place here. So the ALS FRS, it looks like there's a significant effect, particularly in slow progression. So the dashed line indicates people who are on placebo. The solid line indicates people on drug. In the, in the ALS FRS, you want to do better, so you want to be higher. On the SVC, same thing. You want to have more breathing strength, so you want that number to be higher. Uh, SOD1 and NFL, you want to drop, so you want those numbers to be lower. Pretty clear that you're having an effect on, on SOD1 and NFL, although, again, <laughs> error bars are, are killing you here. But, you know, it's dropping uh, SOD1 by about a third and NFL by about 40%. Neurofilament light chain is a measure of cellular damage. Um, and sought to be correlated with how you do with ALS. And so this was actually accepted by the FDA as a potential uh, mechanism for accelerated approval. So it's really based upon that neurofilament light chain that results in approval of the drug just a few months ago. Um, and when the drug gets approved, someone's got to write a newspaper article and somebody's got to be seen doing lumbar punctures. That's just, just how it works. So I'm of two minds about these things because I've said several times that we have trials and the, the results are not good and we should just be honest about that. It's hard in this one because I, 
this gentleman right here, who's obviously very public, he's in the newspaper, I have, I just cannot believe that he would be doing as well as he is doing, given how his uh, rate of progression was before he entered the trial. Um, I, I just, I can't believe that the drug's not having an effect for him. So have we learned, just from this individual trial, have we learned anything? Um, yes. Uh, no, I do think that we get clear target engagement. We do knock down the thing we want, which is, which is very satisfying, because in a lot of these trials, it kind of feels like we're blindly, we're, we're, we're you know, grabbing the tail of the elephant, right? So in this case, we're doing the thing we think we're doing. Are we doing it enough? Does that matter? Fine, we can have that conversation. Could we make it more potent? Sure. Uh, but we're doing the thing we think we're doing. Um, a huge issue was, this brings up that maybe our ALS trials are just too short, right? It, companies want, companies and people want the trials to be as short as possible, right? Because the longer each trial is, the longer it takes you to find something that works. It also costs a ton of money. But as you can see here, like these just keep separating. Keep in mind again that, that you're, you're handicapped in your measurements um, because everyone's on drug after that dash line. But you still see this separation. So this trial was just way too short to begin with. It just needed more time. Um, the, a key to their reanalysis is they realized that how high your neurofilament light chain level is, this measure of neuronal injury was a much better predictor of how you were gonna do than your ALS FRS. Because ALS FRS is a survey of symptoms and people often say things to try to make sure they get into the fast progressor, you know, because they, they, they had certain slots for the trial and they kind of felt like, you don't blame anybody, but they're trying to answer the question in a way that will be advantageous for the trial. And another question is, because it, I don't think everybody responded. So I, I don't think we really have any idea of why certain people responded. We don't, except for one thing would be treating later, once again, is a theme that probably treating earlier is better, uh, which I'll skip to this, which, uh, comes to treating people actually before they develop symptoms. So how do you do that, right? Well, you can't. In sporadic ALS, you can't do that. But in familial ALS, you could treat people who have the mutation but don't have ALS. The question becomes, well, are you going to treat someone from the time they're 10 years old and they're going to develop ALS when they're 70? That doesn't sound ideal. So uh, Michael Benatar has a, the largest collection of SOD1, uh, people with SOD1 mutations. And what he's noted is that there's this inflection in the neurofilament light chain. You can imagine that you're accru accruing nerve damage before you actually get weak. And what they're looking for is this like upward deflection of the NFL before someone's symptomatic and looking at whether or not they can treat and actually prevent symptom onset. So that trial is called the ATLAS trial and it's ongoing. Um, there are other strategies, so we're involved. This trial's taken a long time to get off the ground. It's now, it was APIC Bio, it's now called Unicure. The original, uh, so this, this is an approach where you're using that viral vector to deliver RNA. So one of the disadvantages with ASO is that you have to keep giving them. The body degrades them over time, and so that's why it's a monthly dose. With a viral vector that persistently produces RNA, you, the idea is it's one and done. We don't actually know if it's one and done, but well, you're one and done because we can't give it again because now you've developed antibodies to the thing we just gave. But um, you give this, it gets into motor neurons and it starts producing this RNA that will then silence the RNA you don't want. It's very similar to tofersin in the sense that you're pulling out the RNA that you don't want. Two patients were treated by uh, Dr. Brown on the right uh, and one did terribly. <laughs> And uh, basically it seemed like he had a, he developed a severe sensory neuropathy and that turns out to be a real problem for this approach. Sensory neurons love, love, love to take up this AAV. And when you start producing a protein within them, you can trigger an immune reaction that is very bad for them. So the second patient was on all sorts of immunosuppression, did better, we don't, we don't know. Um, we don't know whether that was just chance or whether that was drug. So there's a trial coming uh, now by a company called Unicure. We were supposed to be doing this trial for a while now, but the APIC bio ended up set, kind of selling the drug to Unicure. Um, and we're gonna try the same immunosuppressive regimen. It's also kind of an interesting delivery method. So for AAV, it really matters where you give the drug. It like is sticky. So if you inject it in the lumbar spine, you get a lot of virus in the lumbar spine. So they're actually using a catheter that you thread up 
and then kind of deliver it as you pull the catheter out. Um, so it's an interesting approach. It's taken a long time to get that off the ground. So familial therapies are a very small fraction. I'm oh, sorry, familial disease is a very small fraction of ALS. So like exciting that we have this new therapy for SOD1 ALS, but I get a lot of phone calls from patients saying like, hey, I've heard there's a new drug. And I have to tell them like, mm, it doesn't apply to you. But the idea is that could we use these same strategies? I said that TDP43 pathology is important in ALS. Could we use these same strategies for people who have sporadic disease, pulling out uh, misplaced RNAs um, that are causing problems for, for motor neurons? So I think, you know, I'm most excited about this partially because I get it. Uh, I can understand how these drugs work. I know exactly what the target is, so maybe it's just my simple-mindedness, but I really like these approaches. Um, but it's still early days, and um, I, I think we're still in the first generation of these, these things. It would be very interesting if we could target people, especially in the familial world, with pre-symptomatic treatment. That would be amazing. Um, AAV is still kind of wide open. We don't know what level of, again, we're provoking these immune reactions. Is it direct toxicity or is it actually an immune response? We're still, we're still working that out. Uh, so these are all the people that I work with at Penn, the, my Penn co-investigators. Uh, again, I've mentioned Bob many times. He's a big figure in this world. And then um, nothing works without research coordinators. So basically, I am a figurehead who signs the bottom of a lot of pieces of paper. Uh, these are the people that actually get the patients in, who call them, who get phone calls. Um, so I really appreciate their work. Thank you very much. Are we okay time-wise? I don't actually, we're good? Any questions? Are there chat questions somewhere? So um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Quinn. I had a question and um, you alluded to this a couple of times, but in terms of like cost of therapeutics like this, particularly gene therapies, yeah. um, I'm, you know, this is, this is something that we, um, not just in ALS, but in many different areas in neurology and medicine in general, as we see sort of the development of these personalized um, personalized and targeted um, therapeutics, um, I think as a healthcare system we're struggling with, how, how do you envision that playing a role in like the, in the future of ALS? Um, like, is this, do you think this is going to be insurance covered? Is this going to be government covered? Do you think that companies will be forced to bring down cost on some of these therapeutics. Curious about how that may play out. Yeah, we're about to find out. Um, I mean, in the muscular dystrophy world, obviously now we have a gene therapy that was just approved that cost $3 million. Um, it's a single, single dose therapy. I think that's actually, I, I suspect that that's the world in which we're gonna learn the most. Interestingly, um, Tofersen isn't, hmm. It's not that expensive. So when you look at uh, Relivrio costs about $150,000. Uh, Radicava costs about $170,000. Again, these are like, these numbers are all so made up because who knows what, who's paying what, but like ballpark. Um, my understanding is Tofersen is only 180 per year. So it's not like they went like astronomically high. It's, it's way cheaper than Nusinersen. And I think that may be somewhat of a response to market forces already. Um, it also might just be that they know they're not making any money off this drug anyway. It's such a rare disease. I have no, I have had zero conversations with people at Biogen about that topic, but um, I think they're, I mean, they're there to make as much money as they can. And I think we're going to have to say no a whole bunch. Um, what's going to be interesting is what is the effect the rebound effect, right? So there's the, we want to charge this, we're not paying it, right? That probably gets resolved at that moment, but what is the effect on, well, we're pulling out of the space because we can't make any money? Um, I don't know. Short answer is I don't know. And I was surprised that uh, Calsati, Tofersen's uh, you know, kind of commercial name, isn't as expensive as, uh, say, Newsonerson's a few hundred thousand. Uh, for for uh, SMA, 
So I think we're finding this out in real time. The other thing is that insurance companies are just straight up saying they don't, especially these accelerated approvals. So I'm treating a patient tomorrow, assuming my flight goes, goes through. For the first time with commercial drug, insurance company did not pay for it. He had to get free drug. I don't, it, it's a little tricky in the first year of a drug approval because it's not on formulary. So it, it, it's, it's a wild world until it gets on their formulary. Uh, so it will settle out. Long way of saying I don't know. Okay. So I think one of the limitations. Oh. Yeah. Um, it seemed like one of the limitations for a lot of the studies were the outcome measures. They're not great, yeah. and they just keep using the same ones, which I, we see in a lot of trials, right? If you could, you know, wave a magic wand, what do you think would be better outcome measures? So. Um, Christina Fournier at Emory, um, and I'm, I'm on these papers, but I have done very little uh, in relationship to these, it has developed something called the Rhodes, which is a, a rash scale. So basically, it's a way of evenly distributing function, so you don't have these big leaps. I suspect that might be better um, in clinical trials. I, but I still wonder if a lot of our failures, just our drugs aren't that good. You know, the one that gives me pause is, is Calsati Tofersen, because I really do feel like that drug works, but maybe it doesn't work for enough people, you know? So yes, I, I, so short answer, I'd, go, I'd like to use the roads and see if that works better. But I also just wonder if we've got an incredibly heterogeneous disease and drugs that aren't that great, and it's gonna be hard to find anything that, that measures. I, I do think bi biomarkers, neurofilament light chain, could turn out to be a really powerful tool. It, it probably, Cytokinetics is a company that made a drug that enhances muscle function, right? So the idea was, well, it's a nerve, it's a nerve problem, but maybe if you could enhance muscle function. Well, I don't think that, even if that drug worked, I don't know that it would drop neurofilament light chain levels because that's not how it's supposed to work. But if your goal is to preserve neurons, I do kind of wonder if these biomarkers could really give you an impression about what's worthy of a big, big trial and what you need to say is not going to have any positive effect. All right, thank you all very much. I appreciate your time.